I'm here with Daniel Farrand. Daniel is a legal director at Mishkondorea with a background in public sector and private law practice. Uh, Daniel's just delivered a paper at the Oxford Planning Law Conference on enforcement. Uh, and as part of that, his paper covers the importance of enforcement action in terms of reinforcing uh, planning uh, principles. Uh, he goes through the various legal mechanisms that are available to local planning authorities, the considerations for local authorities before taking enforcement action, um, whether everything should be enforced against, uh, the effect on property transactions and uh, the use of the Proceeds of Crime Act during uh, enforcement prosecutions. Daniel, I wanted to ask you about um, improper considerations when taking enforcement action uh, when local authorities are looking at cases. Uh, you mentioned uh, proceeds of crime, but I wonder, um, we all see uh, often political motive playing a part, such as the policy towards travellers, uh, the gig economy, um, and development in the Green Belt, an example of which is the government's recent announcement that it was making a £2 million fund available uh, for local authorities to spot and enforce against um, unlawful development in the Green Belt? Yes. Um, well, the decision-making process uh, for enforcement uh, is, is one that the local authorities have got to take seriously. They've got to look at uh, all the good reasons to take enforcement action, and they've got to consider uh, what reasons there are not to take enforcement action. Uh, and one of those, as you rightly say, is um, what the political situation is. Now, it is um, obviously important that the uh, development plan uh, and that proper planning is upheld. That can get to be quite a political hot potato. Um, but that a general principle that enforcement must be taken to uphold the rule of law uh, is not the basis on which local authorities need to be making decisions. Local authorities have to have a local uh, enforcement uh, plan and that should set out what it is they will take into account. Uh, questions of money, as you say, uh, on proceeds of crime isn't a uh, consideration they should be taking into account. Political questions are more difficult. Ultimately, uh, local authorities are political animals and there is a uh, political driver to take action. But as long as that political driver is informed by proper planning considerations and proper balancing acts, uh, that shouldn't be a, a, an absolute bar to taking enforcement action. One thing I do think is a bar to take, that shouldn't be taken into account uh, in the enforcement process that we've not mentioned is, is targets. I know of local authorities who have targets for taking enforcement action, and I don't see how that can possibly be a lawful uh, way to take a decision. If you have taken a decision to bring enforcement action because you are two actions short of your target for the year, that has to colour whether or not that decision has been properly taken. And you mentioned local enforcement plans. How consistent are local authorities in maintaining those? <laughs> um, some are better than others. I think that's probably the answer to any question about uh, how consistent are local mm. authorities on something. Uh, some of them are very good. Um, uh, local authorities could do a lot worse than starting with the um, CPS's uh, code for uh, Crown Prosecutors. There's also um, the uh, Private Prosecution Association has their own uh, guidance uh, that uh, will help understand how the decision-making process should be shaped, and they, of course, also refer to the CPS guidance. Uh, but, of course, enforcement's not just the prosecution. There's the whole process all the way through. And the kind of balancing acts that need to go in there um, can include everything, not just the local plan. It's other material planning considerations. It's uh, the proportionality. Proportionality is a big point. Some of the enforcement uh, actions have a test of expediency. Not all, interestingly. A breach of condition notice doesn't. Um, but that test also obviously has to be applied. And if it is not expedient to enforce, the council should not uh, take action. Uh, during the questions, the issue of funding came up. And I know you've touched on that as well. And obviously, the Proceeds of Crime Act might change this. But uh, it does seem to be a poor relation of the planning system. But I think as one of your examples showed with the Localism Act, it does sometimes shine a light on legal problems and we should perhaps remember that it is useful for that too. It is. I mean, um, there's an awful lot of parts, of moving parts of the planning system uh, that uh, 
uh, really only get explored properly when somebody decides I've got to take action against this or should I take action against this. Um, so it is something that local authorities are interested in. Um, they want to be able to take enforcement action where it's appropriate and necessary. And uh, councillors get their ears bent about planning enforcement. It's, I, I mentioned in my, um, uh, in my talk the idea of a, a sort of a British sense of fair play mm. and the electorate likes to see the rules properly enforced. If it applies to them and they've got to make a planning application, I don't see why whoever should not have to. Um, so there is a political will to uh, keep an enforcement function and to use it, but that will is often often exceeds the funds that are able to uh, to do the work. Mm. Uh, one thing I think which is a common problem if you're <coughs> in private practice is how you advise landlords uh, to deal with uh, enforcement action where tenants are in breach. Do you have any comments to make on that? Yes. Now, some of this comes from the way that the uh, enforcement notice is actually capable of being prosecuted. Uh, were I to let you uh, an office building uh, for use as an office, but you decided to run a bar from there and perhaps put a, a marquee on the roof uh, to, to entertain your, uh, your customers and clients, uh, the council would probably quite rightly bring enforcement proceedings. Uh, they'd serve an enforcement notice on the whole building. They'd serve a copy of it on me and a copy of it on you. The steps would probably to be cease using it as a bar and also to take down the permanent marquee. Interestingly, if that enforcement notice falls due and is not complied with, you can only be prosecuted for running the bar. You can only be prosecuted for carrying on activities and uses that uh, are prohibited. You can't be prosecuted for failing to take down the marquee. However, you have exclusive possession of the property. I'm the landlord. I'm not on the property. I'm not in control of that marquee, and I, it's not my structure. Uh, but I can be prosecuted for it not having come down. So there is a, a strange situation where the local authority is applying pressure to me to apply pressure to you to get the um, enforcement notice complied with. And the lease terms have got to properly reflect that. And I have to use... Uh, all, take, all, take all the reasonable steps that I can to make sure that you do so, otherwise I am guilty of an offence. And do you think that would uh, extend to forfeiture or, in, you know, or termination of lease in some cases? Or I think it could in some cases, yes. Uh, there's a non-planning case uh, up in the, in the north somewhere, um, of Viscomi, it's in, it was under trading standards law, where uh, a, there was a chap, he owned a retail premises and he let it out to some people who sold an awful lot of um, uh, knockoff cigarettes right. um, uh, and they had been prosecuted for it and they've been prosecuted for it and again and they were that was their main business was uh, this unlawful activity but they wouldn't stop because they were presumably making more money out of it than it cost them to be prosecuted uh, despite the potential for proceeds of crime um, and they told Mr Viscomi about this and they asked him to take action many times and he didn't and they eventually prosecuted him um, and did a proceeds of crime confiscation order against his rents because he had not done what he needed to do and he knew that money was coming from unlawful activity and he carried on just Taking that, uh, taking those funds and pretending it was nothing to do with him. Finally, I just thought we'd uh, uh, dwell on the issue of big data. And uh, yesterday, in Gordon Ingram's presentation, we saw a glimpse into well, the present and the future, an extraordinarily uh, detailed uh, uh, view of the city and its environments and real-time information. Uh, are we about to be in a world where enforcement action becomes pretty easy? I think there's a possibility of that. Um, I, uh, I was mentioned in my talk uh, the potential for using drones, the potential for uh, satellite imagery and getting that automatically processed to identify changes on the ground uh, that then could be tied straight to the database of uh, planning applications um, that have been approved uh, or even more, maybe ones that have been refused and built anyway. Uh, and those can be flagged up to enforcement officers. Uh, there's a danger with any big data that what you get is more data than you can process. Mm -hmm. 
we mentioned earlier um, uh, resource constraints you can reduce the resource uh, cost of investigations but actually uh, or at least ident- of identifying breaches of power and control but you still have to investigate them you still have to find out whether how long they've been going on for whether they ought to be granted planning permission um, or, or whether there are other reasons or other things that are going on so there's a personnel um, issue with dealing with that, you know, the consequences of that big data. So I'm not necessarily sure it'll lead to a huge rise in enforcement. What it might do is catch more cases. Uh, we might see a lot more uh, things informally resolved. Thank you.